Hi, I'm Raman Walia. I'm a software engineer at Meta, and I've been with Meta for about two and a half years. We're going to talk about RTC at Metaverse. How we are bringing RTC to Metaverse, and how RTC is uh, is now becoming a building block within the mind of Metaverse. Later, Shreyas is going to come and talk about human embodiment. We're going to talk about three major aspects of of Metaverse being present. The third dimension of Metaverse, till now, RTC is all about the 2D video that we play. Metaverse brings out the third dimension that we we'll now need to take care about. We also need to take care about the state. How do we handle the state? Metaverse also brings in not only a human embodiment, but also all the other objects that are around you, the ball that you're playing with, and how, how does state is being handled in, in the entire session while you're with, with your friends. The first thing we need to talk about is being present. What is being present? Till now, when we talk to our friends and colleagues, we talk on a grid format where we have all our friends listed in a grid and we talk. Don't get me wrong, this is amazing. From an audio telephone call to being able to do videos is amazing. But what about being present? Being present in the same room as your friends, being present in the same gym or maybe a movie theater with your friends, while you're still hundreds of kil kilometers apart. Now that's being present. Being present means you're always on connection. You're not having a call where you're ringing, you're picking up the call, you're talking, and you're keeping the phone down. It doesn't happen that way. Being present means you can talk to your friends while you are playing a game. You can talk to your friends while you're in an office meeting. You can also have the call while you are hopping between the apps. You're, you're, you're in your home and you tell your friends, let's go to a gym. And you're all, all of you are going together to the gym. You're not disconnecting from your home, going to the gym and connecting the call again. That brings its own challenges because home is a separate process and maybe gym is a separate process. Maybe a movie theater is a separate process. How do you make sure that your call sustains over multiple apps while these are you know getting killed these are getting backgrounded and, and and stuff the process boundary brings its major challenges when you're when you're talking about rtc the other challenge that we probably will have is identities each of these app have their own identities and how do you make sure that you sustain a call between various identities you have an identity for one game let's say supernatural you have another identity for another game, let's say a, a Microsoft game. How do you sustain a call between these identities? You, you'd want to be present with your friends while playing a game. And then you'll say, oh, I'm bored out of playing one game. We want to play another game. And then you move to another game. That's where multiple identities gives us challenges. How do we make sure that these identities are sustained across a call? What we've tried to do to, to sort of mitigate these challenges is have a root level service called present service in our VROS. This service is responsible for remote presence across all the apps. Any app who wants to create a session with other participants will send out a request, a pro IPC request, a cross process boundaries request to present service and present service will then initiate the, the actual RTC call per se and connect and then start the data flow, both media and, and video or avatar, whichever is the case. What this gives us is an advantage of being open, omnipresent. You are present across all app boundaries, across all process boundaries. Any process who wants to now take your video frames and show it in their app, can do that as long as they're authenticated, of course. But this also has its own complexities. The moment you talk about IPC calls, you have complexities that comes with it. How do you send data across process boundaries, especially when data, that data is video data and that data is audio data? Just imagine doing 15 frames or 20 frames or 30 frames per second, each frame being four to five MBs, and serializing this and deserializing this huge amount of data across process boundaries your cpu your battery your thermals will go really bad 
There are other issues also that comes into picture. Spatialization of audio. The spatial information of this audio is contained in each of these apps. How do you send that spatial information across bound, bound, uh, process boundaries to present service so that it can spatialize the audio and play it? Either that or you send the audio streams across process boundaries to the other guy, uh, to the app, and they spatialize it, play it, and manage the entire audio streams. Imagine managing 20 of these audio streams. Now, those are the issues that we are currently trying to address. We try to address these issues by using as much of shared memory as possible. There are certain constructs that AOS itself provides, Android itself provides, something like textured surface, where the process that wants to render will send a textured surface and we'll render onto that surface. That basically removes any sending of video, video data across process boundaries. But that also means that we are bound by these Android surfaces. What if the other app wants to do some machine learning on, on the video data? They want to create effects. They want to do so. There is still a possibility where we do need to send huge amount of video frames across process boundaries. And again, we've used you know double buffer and circular buffers to send data across, but those are easier said than done. They have race conditions and, and, and deadlocks and so forth, so that you need to make sure that you handle it. Other than that, Audio, if you just want to play audio, you can capture the mic and you can capture the speaker and play it. Spatialization, again, you'll, you'll need to either send the audio data across process boundaries using shared memory or send spatial data across process boundaries and we'll spatialize. The present service will specialize your audio. That's about the basic semantics of, of RTC. Now we'll talk about how do we actually do a call. You don't have a camera. How do you actually bring humans into a call? And for that, I'll bring Shreyas over and he'll, he'll talk you over. Thanks, Raman. I'm Shreyas. I'm an engineering manager at Meta. And I've been working in the Metaverse space for the last four years. I've been working on RPC for the last two years. And I'll be talking about human embodiment, which is the key aspect of being present. So first, let's look at what human embodiment looks like in the 2D space. Traditionally, calling an RTC has used a 2D self video frame as human embodiment. While this has worked well for people on 2D calls, it's neither feasible and nor optimal to do this in the metaverse, and we'll discuss why. So on the receiver side, if you have a 2D video frame, it's basically compartmentalized into a grid. So these 2D people can't interact with each other, they can't interact with their surroundings, so this creates a less immersive environment. On the center side, it's impossible to capture the 2D video frame of a self camera feed because your face is obstructed by either a VR headset or AR glasses, whichever hardware device you use to basically immerse yourself into VR. So how do we deal with this, right? So there's a gradient of human representations each comes with its own constraints and trade-offs around the quality, fidelity, realism, and the computational resources and network bandwidth required to like, make them possible. So broadly, we have divided these into three types of embodiments or avatars as we call them. On the leftmost side, you see stylized avatars. These are more cartoon-like. They are very light on system resources, also light on network bandwidth. In the middle, you have something that's still a synthetic avatar, but it is much more photorealistic. It has much more heavy workloads on the device. The bandwidth is still low, so that is good. But on the rightmost side, you have something that's like very, very real. It's essentially a recreation of your hologram. That has huge computational workload, also requires a lot of bandwidth. And we use each of these in different scenarios, for example, in a casual fun setting, you might use a stylized avatar, which gives you enough room on the computer to like, really process the game-like workloads in the background. While if, let's say, you're in a work setting, then you might need to use photorealistic or volumetric video, which captures your expressions in much more detail, which is more important in a collaborative setting. So let's go over the technical details and the challenges of each of these avatars. So first, we are at stylized avatars. 
So these are relatively low fidelity, they're cartoon-like, but they're still good enough for most use cases. And here we divide the data transfer into two forms, right? One is you need to transfer the assets and textures to really recreate these avatars on the other side. But the more real-time data that you need to transfer is the skeleton movements, the joint positions and rotations. If you look at the entire capture to playback stack, on the sender side first you need to capture the expressions of these people so that you can animate the avatar. This is done by a fusion of multiple sensors, starting from the audio mic input so that you can animate the user's lips. There's also internal facing cameras, there's eye tracking, so a lot of these sensors together work to create the human expression which then gets encoded, sent over the network, decoded. We then do a round of packet loss concealment, interpolation, extrapolation, and then we finally render it. So next we'll look at photorealistic avatars. So the difference here is how do we make these avatars more real and how do we capture the high fidelity expressions but still send them over the network in much lower bandwidth than a full-blown volumetric video. So what we do here is we create personalized codecs for each person in the call. And this personalized codec really captures the uniqueness of each face and the expressions. We use machine learning techniques and neural networks to really compress this huge set of possible facial expressions into 256 byte embedding. We send that over the network, the receiver inflates that into the real expression and we can have really realistic avatar based conversations in like less than 50 kilobytes of data. Again, the entire stack looks very similar, except for the fact that the ML workloads are much, much more heavier in this case. So what are the optimization opportunities here? We or the computer has a much deeper understanding of the like 3D scene, the avatars, the facial expressions, and the 3D body movements. So this allows us to do optimizations in three places that was not previously possible. The first is interpolation and extrapolation of your joint movements and expressions. Because we have the exact position of each of these joints, if a packet is lost or if there is jitter on the network, we can compensate for it by doing interpolation and extrapolation. We can also do much better simulcast so that we can capture the right level of detail. We can drop packets that, that deal with like smaller joints or smaller expressions that are not visible from afar. We can also do much more concise and accurate delta encodings. This helps us like drive down the, the, the network bandwidth required drastically. Now let's take a look at the most realistic form of human representation, that is volumetric video. This is the highest fidelity. The person is reflected exactly as they are on the other side. But as evident, it also requires a lot more bandwidth and computational power. We essentially create a 3D scene of that person by using a RGB image and a depth map. Then we recreate the scene on the other side. Because we need to send so much data, it's not really feasible to do it in the more realistic network conditions. But the, the, the challenges are like beyond just the bandwidth. It, it also requires us to precisely synchronize depth and RGB frames. Also, like depth compression is something that is not very well researched, so a lot of research needs to happen there. A lot of artifacts that come out of compression are much more jarring to the human eye. So we need to do another pass where we fill in these holes and fill in the artifacts generated by obfuscation by the user's own hands or like the devices that they are wearing. There's a lot of optimization opportunities here because compressing depth is not something that has been very well studied. There's a lot of room to improve our compression ratios there. We need to synthetically fill in some of the artifacts that are generated both by loss in compression and due to obfuscation of a user's face by their hands or the headset or any other object in their surroundings. We also need to deal with very high bandwidth requirements and we need to have a framework where we can react to drop-in bandwidth so that the perceptual quality of the experience isn't too bad. So these are our array of human representations. We use different ones in different settings according to device constraints, bandwidth requirements, and the experience itself. But how do these human, human embodiments interact with each other? How do they interact with the surroundings and the objects around them? 
to discuss that, I'm going to invite Raman to take this forward. Thanks, Shreyas, for that amazing intro on human embodiment, on how do we actually embody humans in the virtual world and how do we transport their data across, across the wire. Now that we know how do we embody the humans, how about the, the world that they live in, the room that you're currently in when, when you're in, in a call? What about the objects within that call? How do we make sure that if one participant has moved the ball from one place to another place, that state is transferred across all the participants and all the participants see this exact same replication, exact same image of the room that everybody is in. For that, we've created real-time world state. The real-time world state is the state of all the objects that are there within, within the room that, or within the environment that you're currently in. This helps us not only identify each object, but also transport the state of each object to all the participants within within the call. There are majorly three things that we need to consider when we are considering real-time states, a world state. The topology that we want to follow of replication of the state, the serialization and replication of the actual objects across all participants, and the latency and reliability of those, those objects. Topology is what we've taken from the gaming servers. Either it's the stateless server or the stateful server. Stateless server, one of the clients is the authority of maintaining the state of the entire world. Any conflicts, any manipulation of that state will happen with that client. Whereas in the stateful servers, the state is maintained by the server. All the participants send their, their changes to the state, to the server, and then server manipulates and broadcasts that state back to the, for all the clients. Obviously in the stateless, we will have double RTT. We are going from the client to another client and then coming back. So the, the RTT, the latency goes a little higher, but we can maintain end-to-end -end encryption because server is just a dumb machine forwarding packets. It, it does not actually know exactly what the packets contain, what state the packet contains. But in a stateful world, we can't do that. The state is maintained on the server and end-to-end -end encryption will not be possible. So those are some of the considerations we'll need to do when we are defining the topology. Once we've defined the topology, we also need to understand how do we replicate all the objects across, across the servers. When we are moving one of one, let's say I'm moving a ball from one table to another table, I need to uniquely identify that object, take the state of that object, and then send it across to either the server or the client. To uniquely identify each of these objects within your environment, we have network IDD, IDs that identify each object. Once the object is identified, we don't move the entire state of that object across the wire. We just take the delta of what has moved. For example, if I've moved a ball, the only thing that has moved is the coordinates. So all I need to send is the coordinates, not the entire object. So we need to make sure that we efficiently serialize the delta and send it across all over the wires. The APIs need to be very ergonomical because the participants should be able to define new objects and the participants should be able to even remove the objects from, from your environment. Ownership is another thing that we need to make sure is well-defined. If I'm owning a ball, if I'm holding the ball in my hand, then I'm owning it. And if I'm throwing it to the other guy, then the ownership change from me to the other guy. So that those things are very well-defined. Once we have replication and serialization taken into account, it's more about performance and reliability, the latency of the changes that goes across wire. UDP obviously is the protocol of choice. TCP IP is too strict a protocol. We don't need it. We just need to, even if we miss a few updates, that those updates can be extrapolated. So UDP is the pro protocol of choice. We've built a reliability layer on top of UDP, similar, same as FEC, to make sure that we are, we are not losing majority of the data. Now Shreyas will come and tell you about what we are doing and what we are looking ahead, the realism, the scale, that we need to operate at. Shreyas, on to you. Thanks, Raman. So let's look at what we have ahead in the Metaverse journey. So if you look at where we want to innovate, there's two axes in front of us. There's realism and there's scale. So in terms of realism, we saw a lot about how human embodiment can be less real to more real on the gradient, depending on the resources available for compute. To optimize it further, we can do much better on-device avatar rendering by further optimizing CV and ML pipelines that we have. 
but that also has its own limits. As devices become smaller, we do need to offload some compute to the cloud. So that's where partial cloud rendering comes in. That introduces its own set of challenges because now you need the cloud rendering to react very quickly to what the user is doing. So it kind of puts a hard latency bound of around 50 milliseconds within which the cloud needs to react. Next, let's, let's look at scale. So if you look at the North Star experience that we want to provide, we want people to be able to attend like a large crowded concert in, in a virtual space. So to do this, we need innovations both on the technical and the product front. On the technical front, we really need to think about distributed media forwarding architecture so that we have a lot more compute power to do personalized media processing for each user on the call. Because based on my position, my expected level of detail, my influence in the call, the media that gets to me needs to be processed. So people who are around me, maybe I hear them more clearly. People who are much further away, maybe I have hear a muffled noise. So a lot of interesting technical challenges there. On the product side, we also need to think about what's workable interaction model. We obviously can't have like tens and thousands of people all talking to each other. It just wouldn't work. So we need to come up with ways for some asymmetric methods of doing this. For example, in a concert, some key participants like the singer might be broadcasters and then they can talk to everyone. While some participant who is much more somebody in the crowd, let's say, they should have a much smaller sphere of influence where their voice can only be heard by people around them. So that's just scratching the surface of what's possible here. A lot of interesting challenges to be solved and it's a great time to be an RTC developer for the metaverse.